regarding him as an equally disturbing force of nature. Melville closed his poem, The Portent, with lines comparing Brown's beard to the tail of the meteor. But the streaming beard is shown, weird John Brown, the meteor of the war. Melville's cryptic phrases recognized that the strange celestial sightings, like Brown's raid, had upended nocturnal stargazing and suffused even that pastime with unease. Walt Whitman also witnessed the same earth raising meteor that inspired Church's paintings. His poem of 1860 is titled Year of Meteors, 1859 to 60, and in it he reflects on Lincoln's election to Brown's hanging, proclaiming, Year of meteors, brooding year. I would bind in words retrospective some of your deeds and signs. I would sing how an old man, tall with white hair, mounted the scaffold in Virginia. Whitman reiterated the connection between the effect of Brown's actions and the appearance of this particular meteor, comparing Brown to the comet that came unannounced out of the north flaring in heaven, that strange, huge meteor procession, dazzling and clear, shooting over our heads. A moment, a moment long, it sailed its balls of unearthly light o'er our heads, then departed, dropped in the night, and was gone. For Whitman, John Brown was the meteor in the night sky, the portent of unavoidable sectional strife centered on the issue of slavery. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that it has taken both scientists and art historians to understand this painting. It was Donald Olson, a physics professor at Texas State University, who wanted to know exactly which meteor Whitman was talking about. And so we went back to the historical record and by process of elimination figured out it had to be the meteor on July 20th, 1860, then ran across Church's painting, then put two and two together, and it is on his research that I was able to base the argument that I placed um, in my own scholarship, which is something that is, I think, a core part of the scientific method. Henry David Thoreau wrote a eulogy that was delivered at, Frank, to, at Brown's grave on July 4th, declaring, the last six weeks of his life was meteor-like, flashing through the darkness in which we live. I know of nothing so miraculous in our own history. The darkness in church's hands becomes a soft purple shot with gold. The inspiration in its palette of color and its mood was derived from his mentor Thomas Cole's fifth and final painting, Desolation, from the monumental series on view at the New York Historical Society, The Course of Empire, which you can see over there, in which the moon casts a wan reflection on the waters as man's empire has crumbled into ruins and nature seems poised to reclaim what man has destroyed. A similar sobriety infuses Church's small painting of a meteor, parallels that would have resonated with their friends, their colleagues, and their patrons. War was declared on April 12, 1861, and by May 19th, Church was at work on his first and only intentional Civil War painting, Our Banner in the Sky. After the lowering of the American flag over Fort Sumter, the North was consumed with flag imagery, and Church's painting was declared our first war picture by the New York Tribune. But the reason I include it here has less to do with that and more to do with its backstory. On June 10th, Church's friend, the rising literary star Theodore Winthrop, became the first Union officer to die in battle at Big Bethel in Virginia. Winthrop had written the broadside for Church's Heart of the Andes and spent the weeks leading up to the declaration of war in Church's studio where he and George Curtis, the editor of the influential Harper's Weekly, talked of nothing else, as Curtis recalled. Winthrop couldn't wait to enlist when war broke out. Stationed in Washington, Winthrop was tired of the inaction and got himself reassigned to Benjamin Butler's forces at Fortress Monroe. Charged with flushing out Confederates hiding nearby, Winthrop dismounted his horse and did something profoundly stupid. He stood on top of a fallen log, sword drawn to rally his men, and a North Carolina sharpshooter brought him down with a single shot to the chest. 
Back in New York, Church read with increasing dread the reports that at first his gallant young friend was among the missing, and after three agonizing days, confirmed among the dead. Winthrop's death stunned the cultural world of New York. Frederick Church reeled from the loss, unable any longer to keep the deadly reality of the war at intellectual arm's length. With Winthrop's death, our banner in the sky accrued a more mournful meaning of, layer of meaning, soberly encompassing loss as well as triumph. For this small work, Church clearly borrowed the palette and composition from an earlier painting, Twilight in the Wilderness, completed in 1859. Quoting from the intense reds and oranges in the sky, Church took an evocative sunset and adapted it to become nature's memorial, the very landscape mourning the dissolution of the union, the state of the nation, like the edges of the flag in tatters. But Church had a more personal reason to borrow from this specific painting, because it commemorated the last trip Church and Winthrop had taken together to Maine in the summer of 1856. It was a trip during which they stopped in Portland to hear presidential candidate John C. Fremont speak. Fremont was an anti-slavery candidate and Winthrop's choice, who would lose to James Buchanan in the general election in the fall. Winthrop's hope for the nation rode on that speech, his enthusiasm for enlisting a consequence of Fremont's loss. Church invested this small oil sketch with all of the emotion he could bring to bear, turning a patriotic gesture into a personal ensign to commemorate the loss of his friend. Our banner in the sky with its lurid high-keyed color, tattered flag, and overt patriotic symbolism is a memento of loss, conflating the national calamity with his own personal grief. The war years proved to be a bounty for celestial portents. The preponderance of meteors, comets, and auroras made it seem as though the American skies, north and south, were witness to an apocalyptic battle overhead that rivaled the actual battles on the ground. Chief among the phenomena approaching apocalypse and days of judgment was the aurora borealis, eerie electrical pulses that gave rise to fears of nature out of control, appearing and disappearing with no warning. From the 1850s, the appearance of the auroras spurred lengthy accounts in local newspapers that contributed scientific data to astrological interpretations. In 1860, the polar explorer Isaac Israel Hayes outfitted an expedition on a vessel he had recently rechristened the SS United States. He wintered over, trapped in the Arctic ice pack. His safe return in October 1861 was cause for celebration, a rare spot, right, bright spot in a winter dark with war. The SS United States had survived an Arctic winter and returned intact, which was more than could be said for its namesake, the, Church of, the Ship of State. At a lecture here in New York on his experiences, Hayes ruefully noted, since we last met in this hall, great changes have taken place. When I left the regions of eternal ice, I little dreamed that a powerful rebellion was desolating my country and that civil war was raging among a people under which, whom I left prosperous and happy. This great national calamity alters the relations under which we now meet. God willing, I trust, yet to carry the flag of our great republic with not a single star erased from its glorious union to the extreme northern limits of the earth. Hayes cast polar exploration as a form of patriotism and endurance as a northern value. No less a literary figure than Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote passionately about the need to fight to abolish slavery using Arctic and tropical imagery to embody the polarities of the conflict. In his poem, Voluntaries, published in 1863 after the New York City draft riots, he honored those who had voluntarily fought. Freedom is described as a winged creature of the far north who reaches out to enslaved blacks whom he described as the offspring of the sun, yearning for freedom's flag on which, quote, the snowflake is our banner's star, her stripes the boreal streamers are. Not necessarily the world's greatest piece of poetry, but effective in the moment. He's a better essayist, let's give him that. It's the passive tense, guys. 
So in Emerson's view, the stars and stripes of the American flag are writ large in the northern skies, snowflakes, stars, and auroras. Icebergs and the Arctic became powerful metaphors for the righteousness of the Union cause and for the inevitable end of slavery. Framed against this backdrop, Church's painting took shape on his easel during the winter of 1864. Under a dark Arctic sky, Hayes' ship lies frozen in the pack ice at the base of a looming cliff. As the ice grips the SS United States and by proxy the nation, the auroras snake across the winter sky like a grim warning from God, a bleak foreshadowing of doom. By this time, it's difficult to find a description of the auroras that do not link it in some way to the Civil War. In the North, there was a cartoon called Northern Light printed in Harper's Weekly showing a Confederate general cowering at the advancing Northern Lights, which appear like the oncoming Union Army, bayonets fixed and ready. John Greenleaf Whittier prefaced his poem, Aerial Omens, by noting that for those who had fought in the Revolutionary War, the auroras were, quote, an army of fiery warriors seen in the sky with banners floating and plumes tossing and horsemen hurrying to and fro. The strange changes of the Borealis were considered by many as ominous as approaching war and consequently excited no little apprehension. The breaking out of war soon after completely confirmed this supposition, and many an aged revolutionist will still yet tell of the wonderful Northern Lights and that he saw the battles of Saratoga and Bennington pictured distinctly in the sky long before their actual occurrence. The auroras lent themselves to yet another layer of foreboding, a metaphorical meaning drawn from the Bible evoking the handwriting on the wall from the story of Belshazzar's feast. A cartoon published by Courier and Ives shows Jefferson Davis, identified as the modern Belshazzar, recoiling from just such a message intended to presage his downfall. The Union forever, the day is dawning, watch and wait, attention Union men. The hour of deliverance approaches, Unionists assert your rights. In this idiom, the South is cast as a modern Babylon, ripe for destruction, for its continued advocacy of slavery and its disloyalty to the Union. In Church's Aurora Borealis, the eerie and silent nocturnal illumination that sways and ripples across the night sky might also be taken for the illuminated words that spelled out Belshazzar's fate. Church's aurora, like the handwriting on the wall, spelled out the nation's apocalyptic fear that the skies warned of imminent judgment. Belshazzar's feast was a popular metaphor at this time, I'll bet you didn't know that, um, and Church's friend, the composer Louis Gottschalk, was writing a libretto for a Belshazzar's feast as Church worked on this painting. In fact, the two of them both met at William Blodgett's house and played a duet on the piano in front of this painting. I love trivia. Um, fear of final retribution lay behind much per public nervousness expressed over the continued appearance of the auroras during the war years, encouraging apocalyptic interpretation of the phenomenon. Hayes spoke eloquently and extensively about the brilliant auroras he witnessed on his trip, emphasizing their biblical and apocalyptic overtones noting that the strange light, quote, glowed as if the air was filled with charnel meteors pulsating with wild inconstancy over some vast, illimitable city of the dead. Churches of Royers are also suffused with this vision of the Arctic night, rendering this illimitable place with a powerful sense of melancholy and discord. Church's auroras are silent flickerings of lurid light that rippled across the sky like a nocturnal, unhinged rainbow. Artist and explorer present the Arctic as an unearthly landscape that functions as the inverse of paradise. If you think of the way Church captured the rainbow refracted in the spume rising from the mist over that famous natural monument of Niagara Falls. As is the case with all great works of art in any medium, Church's paintings are multivalent in their layers of interpretive significance. Far be it from me to confine Church's auroras to any one of those laters, meteorological or metaphorical, no matter how compelling. Because at the same time that Church was putting the finishing touches on this painting, his close friend and traveling companion, Cyrus Field, was struggling to realize a working transatlantic cable. 
Church's painting presents the very same landscape, stretching from the mountainous headlands of Labrador over to Ireland behind Cyrus Field. And like Field's cable, Church's auroras span the Atlantic Ocean, providing electromagnetic impulses that connect distant lands and offer the promise of instantaneous communication across vast and inhospitable distances. No more ships trapped in the ice, delaying the international exchange of ideas. And overhead, the brilliant auroras stretch unfettered from North America across the Atlantic. It is not hard to envision in the broken segments of Church's auroras a metaphor for Field's sequence of snapped cables and broken transmissions. Not all of Church's atmospheric phenomena occur in total darkness. In this sketch, the artist used a straight edge, I mean, I'm sorry, um, in this sketch, Church captured the crepuscular rays that shoot up through the low levels of clouds approaching sunset. Based on the terrain loosely indicated in the foreground, this may have been made in 1865, shortly after the auroras, when Church and his wife, grieving the loss of their first two children and reeling from the impact of the preceding four years, traveled to Jamaica to heal their souls and repair their marriage. Church appears to have relied on this preliminary sketch as he began to compose a painting he would title The Afterglow. In the finished oil sketch that you see in the lower right, Church has added the undulating foreground and mountains of Jamaica. He's made the sky more atmospheric and dramatic. He would then take this amplification one step further in the studio in the larger finished painting called The Afterglow, bringing the viewer closer to the distant body of water, allowing us to stand on the top of a rise close to a picturesque ruin. In an elegiac turn, Church dedicated this painting to the memory of his sister, who had recently died. Further indication of how personally Church felt about this subject, he kept both the oil sketch and the finished painting them, and eventually hanging them at his home, Olana. From his initial observation to the preliminary contours of the painting to the final composition, Church painted the synthesis of scientific truth and personal emotion. Back home in Hudson, New York, in 1866, Church observed and painted a stunning sketch, capturing not just the crepuscular rays, but the waning crescent moon as well. There's a fascinating story about this work that bears repeating, demonstrating Church's lifelong interest in atmospheric accuracy as the basis of his working method. This scene, which had to have occurred near sunset, is an unusual occurrence. Unusual enough that Carl Lotman, the director of the Mid-Hudson Astronomical Association, was able to use NASA software to scroll back through the historic skies and find the most probable date and time the church could have witnessed this phenomenon. That date turns out to be December 7th, 1866, and afforded church the opportunity to record Okay, follow me here. The waning crescent moon, um, the southwestern sky, 4.20 p.m. from Olana Hill, two years before Church had built his house. This was just as the sun set and the moon was about to follow a bit less than six degrees after it. Church, you'll notice, used a straight edge, and you can see the lines right here, in order to line up his rays, um, defining the crepuscular rays. Furthermore, Church had sketched the start of that same lunar month in November 1866, a sketch that is anecdotally described as river through mountain valley with sky and crescent moon. And you can see the orientation. Here you have the waxing moon facing this direction. You have the waning moon over here, over the exact same landscape. So the orientation during the lunar month of November into December of 1866, Church recorded both of these astronomical phenomena from the site of his eventual home on the top of the hill four years before he started construction on the house, which you will see in this oil sketch that he made in August of 1872. In 1883, Frederick Church wrote in frustration I wish science would take a holiday for 10 years so that I could catch up. <laughs> he died in 
He expressed the impossibility of absorbing it all, of grasping it all, of synthesizing it all. And from the top of this hill at Olana, he painted nearly every day from its prospect. Every view, every season, the daily weather added another layer to his experience. Church might not ever catch up on paper or with paint, but in constructing Olana, which he called the center of the world, he created a kind of summation, a point from which he could view the surrounding world and understand in his own mind how it all connected. Church's career reflected Humboldt's assertion that nature and art are united in my work, a fitting approach to understanding an artist's lifelong interest as he looked to the skies for inspiration. Thank you. Oh, I was going to say thank you very much. We now get to the dangerous part of the whole thing, which is I am going to take any question that you want to ask, and I will do my level best to answer it. Um, what I will also do is, let's see. Is it easier to ask you guys in the back to roll forward to the first slide just so that we have Judith's painting on there because it's much easier than using the little clicker guy here? That'll do. And yeah, there we go. No, keep going. There you go. All the way back. Yes, there we go. I just think that you should be able to see the way Judith's meteor is glowing out of that painting, even without direct light on it, and the way that it is glowing in this, because I think that is one of the most amazing things that church does, is finds a way to use pigment in order to actually make you feel that something is on fire and in motion. Um, it is just one of the many things that makes him such an extraordinary artist for the 19th century. Um, so anyway, I, I would be happy to take any of your questions. All right, yes, we have a question in the back. Ellen, go for it. <laughs> oh, microphone is coming, yes. I'm so embarrassed because I can't remember when did church, because I know that church went and um, hunted for icebergs. Yes, he did. And there's that fantastic book about that, um, which I just read, and now I can't remember when he did it. Was that before or after this sort of right period? Right before. It's in 1859. He goes up with Louis Le Grand Noble um, and decides to go up to Labrador. Um, William Bradford was also up there at the same time taking photographs with a camera bolted to the prow of a ship, which must have just been difficult. Um, <laughs> Church had his own difficulties because he tended to get seasick. Um, and Louis Le Grand Noble describes him sketching icebergs in a way that says, think about swinging back and forth on a swing, trying to paint while a pair of colts gamble in a field. And if that doesn't make you feel like you have motion sickness, you're doing better than a lot of people. Um, I remarked to, uh, to Casey earlier today that um, I think that carried forward when Church went to the Middle East. Um, in 1868-69, there is a lovely full page, um, lovingly done drawing of, of a camel. Um, and in the bottom corner, there is a little tiny vignette of a storm-tossed boat. And it took me a while before I realized, ship of the desert. <laughs> Those of you who have ridden camels know what I'm talking about. Their feet go around in a circle. They don't go side to side the way horses or pacers do. So you're like going like this as you're going forward. And I'm sure it was an extremely unpleasant experience. Um, but he did manage at least to survive that, I think, slightly more intact. But Labrador, he was up there in the summer. So it was the midnight sun. Uh, the, the picture that I showed you of, um, I'll just shoot forward to that. Yeah, the picture that I'm going to show you of Labrador up there. Um, that is an iceberg with the late afternoon light on it, um, but it is, it is not, obviously, he's not up there in the darkness, he's not wintering over, um, but he is deeply interested in those moments where the sun barely kisses the horizon and then comes back up again, so you get sunset and sunrise, um, basically you blink and you miss it, and, and it's the next cycle, so um, he was very interested in those atmospheric phenomenon. He also read about ice and read about physics 
trying to understand as much as possible what he was going to see so that he could make the best use of his limited time up there. The last thing he wanted to do was to get up there and realize he did not know what he was looking at. Um, and so when he paints the icebergs and he puts these wonderful veins of compressed ice that looks blue because the refractive index is different than the, the rest of the ice around it, um, he knew what he was looking at. He knew what he needed to capture. And furthermore, he knew then how to blow that up and amplify it with appropriate detail once he got back. Yes, another question in the back. Um, I'm a painter, and I'm very excited about your discussion here, especially as it relates to getting information about science and philosophy. Because I feel today's artists, unfortunately, lack a lot of substance. I will say that I think it depends on the artist. Um, because I, I have had the distinct pleasure um, and the kind of the wild ride, if you will, of spending a couple of hours in my galleries with Alexis Rockman, um, who has read his Humboldt, who knows his Frederick Church, and will argue with you all day long about it if left to his own devices. That's my question. I wanted to ask you yes. if you could spell the name of Humboldt, his first name and give us a possible resource that we could find his work. Absolutely. Um, Alexander von Humboldt, very straightforward. Um, the best biography that I want to point you to is Andrea Wolff's wonderful book, The Invention of Nature. Um, I have read six Humboldt biographies, and that is the only one that I will recommend as the kind of reading that means that you can't put it down, and when you get to the end, you want to start it all over again. Um, the writing is fluid and dynamic. Her incisive understanding of the 19th century is compelling and, and magnificent. Um, I had the great good fortune to become friends with her while I was working on my own Humboldt exhibition. Um, I count her um, among my cherished friends, and our conversations ripped along at the speed of light for hours on end, and I really enjoyed it. What she understands about Humboldt that is so important um, is not so much what he ate for breakfast, um, but what he, she really focused on was why he mattered. What was it that, he, that drove him for those 89 years, 36 books, 25,000 letters, um, and only four hours of sleep a night? So, and what it really was was in talking to um, Georg Forster and Joseph Banks, who went on the Cook expeditions, they were saying, well, you know, we saw these trees, and they look a lot like the ones that we saw in the South Seas. And oh, yeah, we saw them here. And the plants we saw there look like the plants we saw here. And so humble before 1790 is going, I'll bet you the whole world is interconnected, and what I need is to build the data in order to prove that. And so he's looking at plants at the base of the Alps and plants at the base of the Atlas Mountains and plants at the base of the Andes. And if he had gotten to the base of the Rocky Mountains, he was perfectly convinced he was going to find variants of the same plants there. And so he used botany as an index for climate um, and for atmosphere and environment. And I think that you know it, it's not too much to say that um, Humboldt's discovery of isotherms and isobars is the reason we have the Weather Channel. Um, that you know the impact it's still there. If you really want to understand how the whole globe operates as a single ecosystem, um, you can sort of look at it that way. But Humboldt, as I discovered, I switched majors my freshman year in college from geology to art history because I am just epically inept at math. Um, and um, at that point, what I realized was that I really loved art. I was minoring in studio. I loved hiking and landscape painting is geology without the math. Um, and so what I learned to do was to take a fatal flaw and turn it into a strength. I now hire people to do my budgets because I'm not stupid. Um, but what I do is I use that geological history in order to understand how these artists understood the world. And the first thing that I realized was that they're all reading Humboldt, and he's still alive when they're doing it. And so understanding the works that they were reading, understanding the poets that they're reading, the transcendentalists that they're reading, it became easier to knit together the way that they thought about what their role was vis-a-vis -vis art and science. 
Um, whether you are looking at Church or Gifford or Kensett or Whitridge or McEntee or Hazeltine, Hazeltine gets the rocks at Nahant better than anybody I have ever seen, better than Britcher or William Trost Richards, and they are both no slouch at those things. But there are people who really see the world geologically. Albert Bierstadt, who is not really a Humboldt devotee, which is interesting since he is a fellow German, um, still, he understands mountain geology better than a lot of artists, and in his best works, you really believe those mountains exist. They may be super tall, but they are solid as a rock. So what my goal was to do was to get back into a 19th century mindset using 19th century sources in order to understand how 19th century people would have perceived the world. Um, the, the challenge for contemporary artists, I think, is that we now have 200 more years worth of information to absorb. The world is rocketing along. If Church felt he light, needed to take a 10-year holiday, I don't even want to know how long a holiday we all think we need in order to grasp it now. Um, but I think that the great thing, the exhilarating thing of feeling like you are constantly drinking from a fire hose is that you have to have some discipline about where you put the edges. Um, and then you go sailing along because the fire hose sent you down the wrong street, but you're having a really good time because you learned something you wouldn't have learned otherwise. And the whole journey just becomes one out of control episode after another that then we have to corral. Um, there are a cadre of artists, contemporary artists, that I affectionately refer to as Hudson River 2.0. Because like the Hudson River School, they don't all know each other, they don't all like each other, um, they don't have breakfast together, there is no manifesto, but they are channeling the same interests, fears, concerns, and passions about our effect on the planet, about um, global weather, they are interested in climate change, they want to understand how their art can help raise awareness among people um, in this room and outside of this room over why we should be obsessed with all of these matters, why we need to be invested in them, and what role we want to play in being part of that stewardship of this planet that we have here. And I think that for the 19th century, there are still discussions of deforestation, there's discussion about the impact of the tanning industry, um, there's the beginnings of discussion of what we will call acid rain. And so they are aware of those problems. Look at Thomas Cole's paintings with all those snags in them. Look at the way that they think about the Adirondacks and the Catskills, about old growth forests versus secondary growth forests. They are aware of this. There are arguments about deforestation as the roads move west through Pennsylvania um, as early as 1832-33. So I think there's a way of really making those connections front to back. That was an extraordinarily long and digressive answer <laughs> to a very good question, but there you go. Thank you, Eleanor. You're welcome. Very much. Thank, thank you, you no, thank that. all of you for being here. I really appreciate it. And if we turn the lights up, you can take a, a glimpse as you, as you uh, make your way forward uh, of, at the painting again. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.